previously on Bibliosurensis. Yes. So now we're going to talk about, I guess, the reasons why you book collect or where to find you know, books. I wanted that book. And I was like, this is the perfect place to get it, right? Mm-hmm. This is the perfect place to one get it. my first job straight out of college. They look it up. Or I should say and they're like, what? It's not in our inventory. Um, was like, working okay, that's fine. For Can we order it? Actually, mm-hmm. ah, That gets computer. us to the oh. second part. Um, it's out of print. Same price I'm like, and so you're what? telling me like two books have actually mentioned about, about, books, about so there's the other one that she's published by herself a lot yes, of times sort of people are looking okay. for the one I was yeah. actually with so Simone since you brought up the font I was mm-hmm. thinking about and but, I mean I, I say that story find, right now and it almost sounds like a dream but if you can get both it doesn't exist oof, like, the price anymore. goes from yeah. like, it's very rare to find specific genre related yeah bookstores which to the last two of the list of seven invest in homeschool curriculum that builds your library so i mean this is definitely off of a homeschooling centric website but i would have to definitely agree with this i'm not sure what that means though so back to the point that i was homeschooled for a fraction of my life one thing that i really got into was literature because of homeschool And I still have some of those textbooks just because they are an excellent reference and anthology of things. And I can say the same for you. I mean, when we had just started Azure Lorca and you needed to learn a little bit more about actual theater producing, you have a book that you used as a self-taught, but it's in your arsenal till now. It's a reference. Yeah. And collecting those books allow you to build a very good curated library. Like I'm I'm just looking at it right now. We have a section specifically for I guess tricks of the trade. So like let's see. I have designing brand identity. I have an introduction to art techniques which has like all the different references to types of brush strokes and mediums and like paints or gouache and how to use those techniques um i have nonprofit management 101 <laughs> and oh and then i have an interesting thing on um designers books of patterns which is how to make boxes and like those sort of things so yeah i mean anything to add to that um uh, yeah i guess i actually uh understand the the concept of actually doing a homeschool based education i'm not sure does it actually ask for us to follow a curriculum from a homeschool i think that's what they meant but i think i would take it as building your arsenal based on like things you study at home or things that are passionate that you're passionate for okay Okay, that, that one makes more sense to I me. I mean, a great example of that are people who buy self-help books. True. Although it's ironic because a majority of self-help books don't really help. <laughs> um, they're made to entertain you. I, I understand that when I, you know, when I had to actually scour the internet practically for these books that I had to collect, that people leave reviews. And I love those reviews. Mm-hmm. You know, they're actually what got me into these foxholes and allowed me to understand what might be better. Because somebody will drop, you know, some name, some sort of title, and they will tell me, like, don't buy this book, buy this book, because this will only teach you this much. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of why I actually have the collect uh, the the producing theater by Farber. Ordeal about that is that it was from the 1980s and the thing was we didn't really change the format of theater producing until like i guess 
the the Great Recession. Mm-hmm. And by then, everybody had to change everything. Mm-hmm. But it was a good way to actually get me started in that industry to kind of understand... If I spent my money, if I had to ask for money, if I had to, like, get a loan, should I actually pay it back? And why am I not actually paying these people back? And is that legal? That kind of deal. Mm -hmm. These are real questions because there are theater productions that don't pay them back. I mean, I have a, like, like I said, I have a section specifically for those types of books. And I still treasure them. And then lastly, they suggest to go thrifting. Mm, this is where my heart broke because books were my thrift. We would actually go to this one bookstore all the way in Long Beach. Oh my goodness. If, if I can find that clip, right. I'll make sure to put it. Yeah, and like it was like hardback heaven for like, what, a buck? And you were just, I was just in awe. Like, I found like old books batman comic books like done by jack kirby himself and i couldn't believe i was even holding it in my hand and they had more than one copy of like these 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 relics so people if you can imagine they would literally be a dollar right that's the first thing yeah and then for two they actually had shopping carts oh (laughs) <laughs> and your shopping cart would be full by the time you were done. Yeah, it was incredible. Like, I really miss that place too. I remember there was we had like we had a toss of the coin over um, which got Guy de Maupassant. Oh, was this a book we were bringing home? Like there, they had like volumes from like you know the newest publishing of it to like an eighteen hundreds. You know, publishing of Well, it. to be fair, those were in the back collector shelf, and they were not a dollar, but they were pretty well priced. Oh, uh, and sorry, 1900s, my apologies. Yes. But nevertheless, it was just, wow. Yeah. Um, so one thing I like to do, because I, I'm a sentimentalist, is I will go out of my way on an outing to go to a used bookstore or a thrift store um, on vacation. And instead of buying a bunch of like magnets and necky things, um, I buy a book. Right. And if I see a book that's on my reading list or maybe one that strikes me, I'll buy a book. I mean, it links me to things. Like when we went on San Diego our little trip into the city, I found a used bookstore and i that's where I bought my Shadows of the Wind copy. Or I discovered the authoress, Rosalind Miles, through Goodwill. Yeah. In Palm Springs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's a little tip if you're a book reader. I mean, I've even started planning certain vacations around used bookstores. So. Yeah. yeah. I don't like... Uh... The battery actually had like a majority of, I guess, my presence for you. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's where I got my Alice in Underland uh, book. I found a majority of my poetry books over there. And like, they were like, I don't know, sometimes they were falling apart. I'm not sure if that was my fault because, you know, I'm a little rough with my books just because that's why I like to actually get hardbacks. I travel with my books. <laughs> Yeah, well, and... I collected all of my series of unfortunate events from there. Oh yeah, that's right. Well, the majority of them. Yeah. yeah. So just the beauty of of uh, I guess studying your books from home and on on your own actually becomes more fruitful, just for the fact that you actually have sentimental value for these things. Right. Right. So. So, um, that article is done. I mean, it sounds like we agreed with most of it, uh, except for, what was it, the gifting or the trading. Right. So, um, I'm going to link that in our, on our post. So, check that out on the blog if you're interested in this article or you want to hear more detail. Um, lastly, we have an article created by uh, Tara Button who apparently is a, um, she's a blogger. She writes on readitforward.com. She is also an authoress. 
she wrote the book a life less throw away the lost art of buying for life um that actually sounds like a really interesting read but um this article on her blog is called how to curate the ultimate home library making a space that reflects your taste choosing books that excite and other tips from an expert minimalist so i think if anyone would know what kind of books to keep it would be like a pro minimalist Ooh. because that is something we mentioned in the previous episodes we've argued over countless times we're still we still have storage issues with our books uh, we're working on it, but I mean, books are just such a big part of our life. So let's see what she has to say and we'll go from there. So the first thing she mentions is um, you have to definitely evaluate the space and the size of your space and how many books can fit in that space. What do you think? Haven. <laughs> like, how dare you? Don't you don't need that negativity in your life? No. Um, All right. <laughs> I've seen people drop, like, you know, carriages of books to the library because they had to move to a smaller apartment. And that, I guess that, that made some sense to me, you know? But, like, these books that I would find would be rare stuff that you would probably never find anymore. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, no, that's just me i i have a hard time with that i i have a problem people hi my name is eugene and i have a problem. i mean he's not lying <laughs> yeah you know just I, uh yeah so ahead. again like i mentioned prior one way i fix that problem is um if i don't have like a stellar star rating on it and that's one way i use my goodreads is i check my ratings and if it's something I purchased and I didn't kind of, you know, I didn't really like, at least I have a, you know, like a digital track record of when I read it, what the author is, what did I think about it? And if it didn't have that great review, I donate it. But that's how I'm able to keep track of what I read, what I like, if I want to recommend it to someone, if it's a thought in my head, I can always send them the link. That way I'm not gifting them a book, but it also keeps things to a minimum. Um, I also put a lot of books that I know are just going to be like quick reads or I'm, I haven't officially decided on my e-reader. And then if I really, really love it, I will go buy a copy. Okay. okay. So that's one way I do it. Well, I know that my books, I, I give away when I sincerely just don't even remember that I had it in my collection. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you don't remember a certain book in your own collection and, you know, you, you, whether you've read it or not, I think it's a good time to actually let it go. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that I stick to my list of poets mm -hmm. and I collect a lot of Harvard University like publications when it comes down to literature and that stuff's beautiful, but I don't need it all. Mm hmm. Okay, yeah. so moving on, she mentions the books, like the actual books. Um, she says, the aim of mindful curation, whatever you're buying, is to end up with a collection that serves you beautifully, perfectly reflects your tastes, and will be in your life for the long term. Yes, I would agree to that. I know that there are, like, entrepreneurs that rely heavily on just one book and sometimes it's like kind of irrelevant to people but they rely on it just to actually keep their mindset you know on track and mm -hmm. even test their integrity for it so i know for me i have like a collection of essays and i love them you know i love them so much i actually keep them right by my bed they're like diaries for me as i grew up Mm -hmm. And they were like a pinpoint over where I made my decisions. Mm, interesting. You know? How about cool. you, though? Like I was talking about earlier, I, I have some of my literature books from when I was in high school because they were my awakening, I guess, of literature. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to go back to those authors or at least get like little tidbits of the best of the best from those authors. Yeah. Um, 
I have a lot of, when I went to graphic design school, like technique books, I have this like really cool book till this day that I adore, which is called Designing Brand Identity. I brought it up earlier. Um, but each page is literally a analysis as to why the logo was created in such a way, who created it and what was going on like financially in that business as to like why they changed their logo or what was the philosophy or the reason. Maybe they changed CEOs, maybe they changed their mission statement. Um, but it's really cool for me. Very interesting. Um, so those things are sort of like time locks and time frames. And when I need to go back to like corporate identity understandings or if I'm working with a client because I still do consultations, um, I go back to that book and it's a wonderful refresher. So um, then she moves on to uh, what's called culling books, um, which I think is just like rotating your books. And I feel like she's coming for you in this. She's, I won't read the whole section, but um, with this end goal in mind, don't hold on to books because you think you should or because someone gave them to you and you'd feel guilty. Um, okay, gift books. I know that I've been guilty of actually, you know, I guess giving them away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like it's... It's a hard thing to actually give away because as a sentimentalist, you obviously feel like you're entitled to this book because it's a piece of somebody else. And sometimes, you know, you don't want to keep a picture or you don't want to like, sometimes you don't want to record the event by video and you want it to actually live in the moment. And that gift is actually way more valuable to you right. than seeing their face. Right. You know? Like my red wall book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but. I totally agree. So she has three questions she wants to ask yourself oh, when you're no. going through a book. Is this like Marie Kondo? It is like Marie Kondo. Are oh you ready? Oh my god. Will I or anyone else in this house read this again? Hell no. Well, <laughs> me, I will, but people So that's the house? a question to ask. Yeah. Um, would I highly recommend and lend this book to anyone? And the third one is, is it a beautiful book that I get pleasure from seeing on the shelf? Yes. Oh, yes. Like, it is like, to me, it's like a, it's like a painting. If you guys ever collected art before, you know, it's addicting, you know, mm -hmm. when you actually get that, you know, that, that canvas on your wall, that frame that actually holds it. Like, it's a precious thing to you. And that's what a book collection feels like to me. Now, mind you, I actually have slowed down in buying books, but I have actually built up my palette over reading books, which are two different things. I have to at least, like, calm everybody down, because I'm pretty sure you're going to be disagreeing with me on this, dear audience, that buying books and reading books are two different hobbies, just because it says Books in the hobby does not mean that it is the same thing. No, I can agree to that. I've seen a lot of that, actually. Yeah. And the thing is, like, again, the library cur curation, if you trust that library and their system, you can find that book again. You can. Yeah, well, going back to this article, I think it's, again, you're curating your personality, so when people walk into your room... You know. Yeah. And the thing is, like, when you have a library, it should be of books that you won't be able to find again. It's funny because, like, if we get someone we're getting to know or so on and so forth and right. they come to our home office and they see our book collection, you notice that they take a good gander at it. They think they can figure your personality out. Oh, my God. Based on it, which I think is <clears throat> kind of interesting. I mean, I don't know. They're half right, they're half wrong. I mean, they're half right because, yes, like these books kind of built me, in a sense. Mm -hmm. But they're half wrong because this isn't my entire reading collection. That's exactly what I was about to get to. Like, a lot of the things you keep are kind of a paper trail of your history. Yeah. 
But it doesn't mean it's currently your mindset. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, like, half the time, my reading list might actually be several articles, you know, from business magazines or Mm -hmm. articles that have found snippets here and there. And it's a pretty good way to kind of, like, I guess, sharpen your sword if you're ready to actually argue with people. And arguing doesn't necessarily mean you have to win. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the beauty of actually understanding what the structure of arguing is about, is to challenge whether you are actually thinking straight or not. And if it really does make sense, and does it actually make a difference? Right. Because sometimes the difference that can actually make in somebody's, I guess, philosophy or understanding of the world is just by accepting your loss and sometimes humility actually helps sometimes just being around that person makes a difference and obviously i'm thinking philosophically right here but it's nothing but the reflection of being a reader okay (laughs) (laughs) i don't know carry on carry on okay well there's um a sub article in this article Um, And she gives us a top 10 list of, I guess, genres and how to find and make the most of your books. So she moves into fiction and she says, looking at your current collection, look for things that feel transformative. Transformative. Mm -hmm. Like identify the books that were transformative for you. Okay. Okay. So basically, like, if Christmas Carol actually made a difference in your life, keep it. Mm-hmm. But if Shawshank Redemption had, like, a novel and it was just literally for pure entertainment, toss it. What's interesting is she brings up, um, find the most knowledgeable person you know about books which are usually at libraries or independent bookshops, and ask them to find something that will give you a similar experience. Okay, I will say this because I've I've tested this. Smaller libraries actually have stronger readers. When you go to the bigger libraries, they're they're just hired just to make sure that the library is intact. And sometimes they don't have an opinion. And that hurts. Like, usually you have to, like, kind of ask around who's the head librarian. Then mm-hmm. he has the, the actual, you know, answers for you. Mm-hmm. Like, he has a real opinion. But at least that's my experience. Um, obviously, some people's, you know, uh, tastes are different and you may not agree with them. So do your best not to judge them. Well, the second one is really interesting. Um, it goes into biographies and that's something I've just recently started collecting a yes. little more of, but I like this cause it kind of coincides with our modern social media kind of society. She says, choose biographies that will inspire you to a positive action rather than inspire jealousy or self-criticism. That's interesting. I really like that. I can't agree more. I mean, I think that self-comparison is horrible. I mean, a recent book that I just finished was uh, Lean In Mm -hmm. by, I forgot, it's Sandy something. She's the, she's worked at Google and Facebook. I believe she was the CFO for Facebook. But, I mean, there were points where I I just could not relate to her because she was like this wealthy jewish high class heiress kind of person um raised in like you know like i guess the elites and you could totally tell and it just i felt like she was losing me just because of her lifestyle but then i felt like her advice was very um inspiring and it was very like down to earth so I mean, it, it's like I was able to bridge the gap, even though I couldn't relate to her lifestyle. I was able to relate to the way she treated business and the way she treated um, women in business. So it's a really interesting read. It's not on my top recommendation, but I definitely recommend if anyone is 
into small business or just looking for inspiration and you are a female, do check that book out. What got you started on that? So I wanted to just understand and pick the brain of other female entrepreneurs. Okay. So that's why I thought it'd be interesting to hear, like, what was her struggles? What does she expect the world of female entrepreneurs to be like in the future? What are we working towards as a whole? And that's the reason why I picked the book up. Is that something that you pick up often? Because I know... No, believe it or not. I mean, more recently, yes. Okay. Um, But no. All right. I mean, here's the deal. I know that you, we talked about Julia Child earlier. Mm-hmm. And she didn't get her career until she was how old? Yeah, so that's, she's one of my more inspirational, um, she's my favorite biography. Because she talks about all her failures. Like, a lot of people don't know this, but she actually went to New York to study uh, theater. And she got her degree in theater and she actually really like lived that hardcore New York lifestyle where she shared a tiny dingy apartment and tried to hash out as much writing as possible. She wanted to be a playwright or an article writer or something in theater and so forth and she just failed. And her mother was actually um, diagnosed with severe cancer so she ended up moving back to Pasadena just to care for her and she literally just lived a good chunk of her 30s as a caretaker for her mom it's kind of you know it it sounds too modern in a way for me like for uh, the millennial generation yeah um but She didn't really pick up her life, I mean, until she found this weird passion where she followed... She basically got into the army or in the military, and that's when she met her husband, Paul. And her husband, Paul, I believe, was, like, in the architect or some sort of artsy department for um, the military and had to travel. So she was kind of like this housewife, eventually, at Paris... And she didn't know what to do with herself, so she just fell in love with the food and wanted to learn how to cook it. <laughs> and that's that's what started that. And imagine, like, it was just kind of this passionate second hobby. She was, like, what, in her 40s? She was in her 40s. I mean, it even goes into her woes about crying how she'll never have kids because they got married so late. And how jealous she was, I believe, of her sister or sister-in-law, but like a family member. And that was like something that they struggled with. So it was really interesting. So, I was just, uh, I guess what it comes down to at all, like, when you actually read these biographies, they're supposed to be, I guess, less about you. Yeah, I love biographies because um, when I was in a low point, I I brought this up, I was in a low point in my life at one point and the only thing that seemed to help was books because not only did I get to see a person's different life, but I got to see a different way of thinking and a different way of problem solving. And it wasn't until I got to think in that abstract manner or realize that there was more about, like, other than me and my little whoa pile um, that I really got up. So I look for books that inspire me or allow me to think outside of the box or not the way I would think, I guess. And that's why I love biographies. It's wonderful. Wonderful. So let's see. What's the next one? Um, Oh, comic books and magazines. What's the difference between hoarding and collecting? And uh, you should put them in folders and label them or organize them. That's what she suggests. I totally agree on that. I remember, like, a lot of people back in the 90s would have, like, these boxes, like the ones that you actually used to move, and would actually categorize them. Now, the ordeal is, I don't think we have that kind of room to actually collect comic books. Which is, I think, why I don't collect too many comic books. I'd rather actually wait for the whole omnibus. Mm -hmm. 
just actually enjoy that stream of uh, story, especially when I follow storylines. I know my favorite uh, omnibus is of uh, the Captain America, uh, the death of Captain America, mm -hmm. the comic books leading up to it. I know for you was actually the Court of Owls. So lately, I've been digesting my comic books by checking them out digitally in the library. And I love that because I get to see a full high digital version of it in front of me. And I've been reading everything from like vintage to modern, like you said, The Court of Owls. I just finished, finally finished, I believe it was Frank Miller's Daredevil. That was mm. a good read. Yes, always a classic. So, yeah. Okay. Well, I don't uh, disagree with that. Mm -hmm. I do know that. I have like two uh, two magazine collections that I am, I guess, hoping to actually throw out sometime. Because mm -hmm. deal is with me, I know ma magazines are beautiful, but unless the whole magazine is perfect, I can't keep it. Okay, I I can take I can uh, I can't take any more watch ads <laughs> in my pages. Mm. I'm I love just collecting like the snippet of articles because. You don't know this, but... Well, I, I should say you don't know this. Uh, I didn't know this. <laughs> but there are articles that people resell to other magazines. And it's hard to follow them. But when you can find them, you know, cut it and save it in your, you know, your booklets or something. Because th those are a treasure. Hmm. they're wonderful like they may never even like reach a book and that's the saddest part because it makes more money as an article and the rarity of it is just makes it a jewel but i don't know what do you think about that um yeah that makes sense i mean in terms of clipping articles one thing i love finding is a book review of the book sandwiched in the book if it's a used book yeah and i i love finding those sort of little things those are beautiful. Yeah. Because at least that way, it's actually precious to you. Mm -hmm. And you know that that person actually, you know, did some sort of treasure hunt to get that working for them. I mean, like, I'm pretty sure in my head that they found the article first. And then they had to actually look for that book. Mm -hmm. At least that's what I think. I don't know if there's any other method. And... I'd be surprised if there were, like, something that was done still today. I know also with collecting magazines, um, I actually have two nostalgia magazines that I keep with me. Um, one of them is, uh, Craftsman Magazine, which I, I have a guilty addiction to Craftsman, historical Craftsman houses, and not only does it have articles on Craftsman houses and the history behind craftsman houses all of the ads in it are about the restoration of craftsmen's like where to get resources for those things like replacement doorknobs or um redone lanterns like reproductive lanterns for your front porch and just the whole thing is total eye candy uh, the second one I have is actually restoring Volkswagen Beetles. And I got it in the... I believe I even got it on a vacation when I was in high school. I think I was traveling. But just the whole era of getting bugs fixed. And at the time, like, what things you could buy. Like, all the ads are about, like, the rims and the cute little things you could add on to them. So, and at that time, they just brought back the new Volkswagen Beetle. So, it was kind of cool to see the old mixed with the new and what things you could add and what were the additives for the new ones and so on and so forth. So, on the list, um, the next thing she mentions is coffee, table, and art books. Coffee, table, and art books. Yeah. That's practically a test shed all in one title only buy these if you have a deep appreciation for what's inside otherwise it's a monstrous lot of paper and ink 
Okay, guys, go to Rodeo Drive. There's actually a Tashan <laughs> shop there, and that's literally all they sell. It's interesting because it. This is an interesting tip. She says, um, limit your, col- or try to split your collection into 12 and assign a month of the year to them. That's pretty nice. That's really cool. Yeah, that that's kind of what we do with our artwork already, because we have an armory for that. So we do. We should actually we try We should that. curate a table shop yeah. or an art book month calendar sort of thing for our tables yeah i think that we should definitely try to look into that that's pretty nice we'll let you guys know how that goes maybe that should be something we'll start with now i think you should actually post that on the on tea the blog hunt. or the tea hunter yeah we'll see we'll we'll, see. we'll we'll find a place for it but um yeah i'd love to try that okay yeah wonderful Maybe it's a monthly thing we put up on Bibliosinensis. Who knows? Yeah. Anyways. Um, then they go into the category of reference and self-help. Go on. Um, you often get what you pay for when it comes down to reference. Two books that have similar titles, but the content can be different. Find as many reviews as possible. I think you brought that up. I did. Um, if the book looks super expensive, borrow it from a library and see if it's indispensable. Yeah. Cause that is an issue. Cause like, all right, there's, there's more additions to the producing theater books. Mm. There are more. They're, they're yearly. They're annually. But if you just buy the 1980s, like almost maybe between 84, 86, it says the same exact thing. So, a fun scholarly tip, because, like I said, my day job is I teach. Yeah. If you are looking into, like, how-to or, like, career-driven books, yeah, and there's one that comes highly recommended, go look for the author mm. or authors in the book. And nine times out of ten, they actually have a scholarly article for free on scholar sites that you can download for free. Again, five times out of ten of those articles are the beginning chapters of their section of that book. Mm. So um, that's how I discovered the Nonprofit Management 101 is I actually found the scholarly pages for it and how the book is designed because I'm sure everyone out there also won't buy a book if it's just hard for them to follow through with, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, that actually brings me to publishing for profit by Tom, uh, Thomas Wool. This actually is useful to buy over and over again because the the deal is with this guy is that I bought his fifth edition and he just updates it mm-hmm. every edition. I don't know if you're supposed to be doing that with the same title. I could have sworn you could actually make more money making, you know, newer titles. But he updates each edition with the trend that's happening in the, public, in the publishing industry. That's really cool. It is because a lot of people will fall and they will actually go bankrupt easily in the publishing industry right now. And I guess I could kind of just say, follow this guy for now if you are a self-publisher and maybe wanting to become a publishing company yourself. Because without guys like him and people he might actually recommend, because a lot of these guys, they're in a, in a small circle. You'll get lost and you will you will be lost to obscurity. Interesting. So that's, nice. that's interesting that, you know, references and oh, yeah. how, helping, you know, how to... Scholarly pages are the best. Yeah. I mean, I fell for the Maxwell Gladwell trend of like i guess self-help when it comes down to finances and such Mm -hmm. i'm just gonna say if you don't know what you're doing and you have like no confidence in that area of business Mm -hmm. then yeah go for it it's great they will go right ahead and build you up you know you may not even have to talk to people for it but you know if for somebody that actually already understands half the business and all you really need to do is actually learn accounting don't don't worry about these guys, you know? They're there just to actually help you with your confidence. They're not there to help you with your finance <laughs> sometimes. Mm. 
Yeah, you gotta research. Yeah. Because, like, either you 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 dive into a pit, or you will fly to the heavens with uh, with your choices here. Yeah, agreed. So Absolutely agree. So, uh, next section. She brings up cookbooks. Cookbooks. We were there. Yeah. Um, don't let them languish on your shelves. Type up all the recipe names you want to try for a master list. That's ridiculous. Nope. No. That's too much work for no, no, me. No, no, no. Okay, so in my opinion, because I don't collect a lot of cookbooks, but I'd love to collect more cookbooks. I actually, that's actually on our list of unique bookstores that yes. I'm going to be putting on the list. But there's actually a cookbook bookstore in Chinatown. I look for books that speak to me in like I guess what I want to get out of that culture so um there's a few books that I have like one I have is uh it goes over the different regions of France since we were talking about French cooking and that's actually what inspired me to you know after the Julia Child I'm like I'm gonna get me a French cookbook and I got that one specifically, not because it was just aesthetically gorgeous, because it had all the different pictures of all the different provinces and the cities and just the landscaping, but it also had a little bit from every region, and so I was able to try different types of French cooking, and that really helped. It's another one I have. Oh, I have this one that I got at a museum. And it's an old, old republished publication over um, the different types of tea treats you can have for different types of tea, like high tea, holiday tea, outdoor tea, summer tea. Um, and it, it's usually like they have a sandwich or like a savory followed by a dessert and then like what tea pairs with it and that sort of thing. And I love it. I mean, I, I adore that book. It inspires me a lot. It's what taught me how to make shortbread. So um, the base recipe in there is actually what taught me how to make shortbread. I do understand, guys. Like, when you buy a recipe book, it is it is like a how-to book. Mm -hmm. So don't spend so much time in trying to actually categorize these things. Because obviously you could type them down or take photos of them. Just keep the book. Most of the time, you are try you're trying to get to do what the cookbook recipe is trying to get you to do you are shopping for this food you are making this food like you don't make i guess uh flash cards for i guess mechanic books do you like that's kind of awkward to me well to be fair so there are some books i've gotten rid of over the years because i find myself only using one recipe Okay, so, that makes sense. Like, I have this, I had this huge book, and it's pretty famous, actually. It's um totally Americana to me. Recipes found on the back of food labels. <gasps> yes! I, I still have, I think my mom, like, I tried to give it away, but my mom took it. Um, there was one recipe I go to religiously, and that one is the Philly Spritzers. Hmm. So, if you guys want that recipe, I will gladly trade it. They make the best Christmas cookie. It's like a cross between a sugar cookie and a cheesecake. And they are just amazing little cookies. But I got that from that cookbook. Speaking of, I guess, things that you want to kind of collect and actually just enjoy in your bookshelf. Mm -hmm. I remember we were looking over for... Uh... Sears catalogs for houses. Yes. Yeah. During college, I actually stayed in a Sears cottage. It was like a little, not even 500. No. I think it was shy of a 500 square foot house. Yeah. Very small house. <laughs> and um, they used to have a catalog they for They used these to, yeah. And I've, I'm, again, back to the craftsman house movement and just the old architecture, but... Yeah. I understand. I, I guess what I was trying to get at was just that in collecting these things, they have monumental uh, purpose historically. Mm -hmm. 
oh, this, I guess what it comes down to the craftsman houses, is that kind of like how recipes are like? I mean, do they disappear? I gotta ask, because like, I, I realize that everybody has their own, their, their own version of jambalaya. Yes, so um, when I look for recipes, they do disappear, but I think what, what I've noticed is people kind of rehash the same recipe, but I think one thing I love about a good cookbook and like the reason why they're worth exploring a few here and there i mean for the example of shortbread i mean shortbread is pretty much like three ingredients it's butter flour and sugar but it's how to prepare it and the technique and like the degrees cooked or like the method that makes it worthwhile okay yeah okay so that's what i look for i mean shout out if anyone knows chef john from food wishes i mean i think the reason why he like so successful aside from just fresh delicious food and like rehashing classic recipes is he is very animate about educating you how to cook and technique and that's why i think his youtube channel is so successful so hey chef john thank you by the way still do that prosciutto wrap chicken so thanks (laughs) (laughs) yeah Okay, then I guess, I don't know, I guess I've had this weird misconception that you don't need to actually write down these recipes. I still keep a catalog. I have a classic old school recipe cookbook card thing. I love them. I feel like if you really love entertaining and you really love cooking for your guests, I mean, it just adds a whole layer to share your favorite recipes or to write notes or versions of the way you prepare it. Like when I make lemon curd, it's based off of an original recipe from like that old tea time book. But the way I make it, I put extra juice in mine or I put a little bit of extra something Or some techniques ask you to just use egg yolks. I don't. I use the whole dang egg. And I find ways to adjust. So if I know that, I'm not going to always remember that if I keep referring to that. So I'll write the card down. Okay. So I have my own arsenal for a cookbook, theoretically. But I think that's the great thing about recipes is just that everything evolves or there's a different spin or there's a different way of doing things. Okay. Okay. And let's see. Oh, so this is interesting. So one of the last things on the list she brings up is audio and eBooks. Okay. Um, she says keeping a library in the cloud allows you to get information when you want to. In your cloud or in your In app? your cloud or app. Because personally, if I put it in my Google Drive, mm-hmm. then yeah, yeah, I do that. I've I've done that for uh, law books. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, you want to reference like some of these books over and over and over again just to actually write contracts because that's, that's what I've done for a few people. And they're fantastic. They're great. But... If I had it on Hoopla or if I had it in any other app, they disappear in like a few weeks and that hurts. <laughs> so we did that. We transferred a lot of our books that aren't like collectible, collectible, collectible titles, yeah. but we love them and we've turned them to audiobooks or, or ebooks. Uh, ebooks. Yeah. Yeah. So. They're all sitting in our, in our e readers right now. Yeah, and then she ends up discussing maintenance, and I thought this was a nice way of looking at it, um, because I think the hardest part of having, being a collector, is learning what to let go of. Yeah. Which we've talked about. Um, But the way she puts it is, finally, enthuse the next generation by introducing them to your library. Lending them favorite books and sharing your knowledge. They'll be the ones keeping your books alive in the future by reading them. This is very true. Because I've, again, I've worked at a used bookstore. And some of these collections that we would actually buy, the reason why we get it for such good cheap prices is because the person that inherited this library 
Mm-hmm. Mind you, this usually these libraries have like expanse amount of authors you could not believe were actually even in shelves still. And they just give it to us almost for free just because they didn't know who these people were. You're just like, wow, really? Like, you inherited a library. Do you understand what is, like, so beautiful about that? You practically have inherited, like, a piece of your relative's soul. And you could actually argue with them after, you know, posthumous here. One of my favorite heirlooms that I actually own is like a yearbook from my grandpa's um, year, I guess, like high school years. Yeah. I also have um, a collection of when my grandmother did a lineage like track before Ancestry.com and all that stuff was a thing. Yeah. Um, People would actually hire archivists to do personal commissions and it's really cool because there were documents and the letters of that they sent back and forth are also in that folder but yeah it's really cool i also have their bible and i have like some of their favorite books i think i have some of their magazines okay but i mean i don't have a lot of things but yeah i i totally agree with that it's lovely Mm -hmm. all right But that concludes this. Thank you for those of you that have made it this far to the second part of this um, episode or the next episode, which is part two. This was a really engaging topic and I hope it's inspired you to go out there or to browse and go through what we call what the (laughs) foxholes. Um, yeah. And try to find your collection. We'd love to hear about your collection. Um, what do you collect? What? How do you display? I mean, maybe that's a whole other subject, but um, how do you go about collecting? Is there something we missed? Maybe something you want to bring up in the discussion eventually? Um, we'd love to hear from you. Again, we are, we, for the past couple of hours, have been drinking Everglen. Um, it's absolutely one of my favorite teas just because it just brings a nostalgia and isn't that in the end what collecting is about is just what makes you happy and tells about your personality. You know, with this tea, I was able to bring you a bit of my tree house growing up in the apricot trees and I would literally eat my fresh apricots in the middle of summer right off my tree, um, while playing and I would even feed some to my pups. So um, that's a lovely moment that I was able to capture and send to you guys. Um, We look forward to hearing from you guys and talking about more books in the future. Uh, Just to let you know, we are available on Instagram and on Facebook. So catch us there, follow us, subscribe, however you'd like. And of course, where all podcasts are found, you can probably find us. And until next time... Cheers. Cheers.